Dr. Michael Rose is a prolific evolutionary biologist whose work on aging has transformed the field, thanks to his influential book, Evolutionary Biology of Aging. In 1997, Rose was awarded the Busey Research Prize by the World Congress of Gerontology. In 2004, he published Methuselah Files, followed in 2005 by a popular book on the topic, The Long Tomorrow. His most recent book with L.D. Mueller and C.L. Rouser is, um, is, do, sorry, is Does Aging Stop? He has more than 300 publications and has given hundreds of scientific talks around the world. He is currently a distinguished professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Irvine. Today, he's gonna to be speaking on biological immortality. It is real. Please welcome Dr. Michael Rose and Joe Bardeen to assist. You should be on. Hello. There you are. Here we are. So it's my first time at People Unlimited. Uh, it's very exciting for me uh, since I've been hearing about you guys for years since I first spoke at Radfest. And uh, if I have a tribe in the world, this is it. So it's it's it's, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I I look forward to getting to know many of you today and tomorrow. Um, and yeah, please come up and ask me a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love being questioned. Also, uh, this presentation, like all the Ageless Education presentations, will be available online at peopleunlimitedinc.com, and then you go to Ageless Education, so you don't have to worry too hard about uh, uh, trying to photograph it with your phones. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it, we had an interesting glitch. Uh, the uh, PowerPoint slide, uh, for my title slide I, I actually sent was written, Biological Immorality is Real. Uh, and that's not the first time I've made that mistake. Uh, We've been accused of many things. Which, which is probably revealing. But no, no, my topic is actually biological immortality uh, and its reality. Um, <clears throat> now, I've been talking about biological immortality for many years. Um, many of my colleagues really dislike it when I do that. Uh, there are actually some fairly profound scientific reasons as to why they dislike me talking about this. Um, I'm not going to deal with any of the ethical issues, any latent deathism or anything like that. Yeah, I'm I just going to talk about the I think the we're science. good on that. We're good on that. I think we're good on that. Yeah, I here. think people like Joe and, and Bernie and Jim are all much better at that than I am. This, um, this audience is anti-deathist. Anti-deathist, yeah. <clears throat> as am I. So, uh, so what I'm really going to try to do today is to give you some scientific background as to why you are warranted in a focus, in an ambition toward biological immortality. And for those of you listening at home, this doesn't mean you're Greek gods. It doesn't mean that a jackknife semi can't kill you, okay? We're just talking about whether or not aging will kill you, okay? That, 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 that's what our issue is today. So I've spent uh, 43 years of my life working on the aging problem, uh, ever since I turned 21. And, and that's actually what I've been paid to do. So for me, it's like, in one sense, no great act of nobility. You can learn a bit about my journey uh, toward biological immortality as a scientist in my book, The Long Tomorrow. Um, however you get, come by a copy. I know these days you can get books illegal, illegally. That, that's fine with me, okay, just as long as you hear the message. <laughs> but today I'm focusing on what I think is my biggest point of conflict with almost all of mainstream gerontology, biology, the NIH, you name it. And that is the reality of biological immortality. So now let's see if I can make the slide thing work. Okay, so, and, and, and Joe, don't be shy, you know, interrupt me a lot. 
Um, this is stupid. <laughs> this is stupid? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see how stupid we can get. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what is Joe doing up here? Okay. Okay. Just, I'll, I'll make this really simple, okay? Uh, I, uh, I'm Sheldon, he's Leonard. I'm Spock, he's Kirk. I'm Sherlock, he's Dr. Watson. Okay? So he's here to provide some humanity. Okay. And, I, I can and, do that. And, and some explication. Because I will, I guarantee you, use words you've never heard of before, and I won't even know that you've never heard them before. Okay. You good with that, Bernie? Is that good? Exactly. Exactly. Joe needs to do what Joe needs to do. So, we're going to start off gently and just talk about different rates of aging, okay? So, some of you have heard of the bristlecone pine. They live in the Sierra Nevada. They can live thousands of years. Um, but they are aging, they're just aging at a phenomenally slow rate. Uh, then there's soybeans, which basically grow over their growing season, hit reproductive maturity, uh, produce their seed, their beans, and so on, and then die within weeks. Okay? Now, of course, a simple way to think of what you want to do is you want to go from here to here. Okay? Because on a scale of thousands of years, you're more like a soybean than you are a bristlecone pine. Right? Which is, you know, ugly. So here's the poster babe, okay, Jeanne Calment. She lived 122 years. She died in the summer of 1997. Um, there's a controversy right now as to whether or not this is a case of fraud. I personally do not think it is fraud because she talks about selling paintbrushes to Vincent van Gogh in her hometown of Arles, France, where van Gogh lived in 1889 for a time shacking uh, up with Gauguin. Uh, Paul Gauguin. Um, and the reason why I think she's real is because instead of describing Van Gogh as this wonderful, saintly, creative person that we're all taught that every creative person is decades after they died, <laughs> she actually describes Van Gogh as a disagreeable, dirty, s scary man that she was personally afraid of. Typical artist. Exactly. Or scientist. Or scientists. Or, yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're creative so. too. We're disagreeable too. And uh, that's actually a very accurate portrait of what he was like, especially at that time in his life. He was weird and scary. Okay? So that's not something that you would have picked up from the general culture, not generally known. Uh, so I, I think she's real. I think she lived 122 years. And today and tomorrow, the fact that she lived 122 years is going to be very important for what I'm talking about as a scientist. Now, what is the true cost of aging numerically? So right now, on average, life expectancy is around 80 years, a little higher for women, though in fact, over the last three or four years, it has been declining in the United States of America, which is an appalling tragedy and loss. Attributable to opioids? In, in part opioids, uh, I think deaths of despair which is suicide, opioid abuse, um, elevated car crash rates, especially in men who may be cryptically committing suicide. Yeah, deaths of despair. So leaving aside whatever has really gone badly wrong in the United States since 2016, no comment. Long topic. Uh, yeah. Uh, what would our life expectancy be like if we continued to die at the same rate we die at our minimum death rate, which is somewhere around the age of 12, okay? Different people do this calculation different ways, but we would live between 1,200 and 2,000 years. So that means 12-year-olds are, are least likely to, that's the age you're least likely to die at. Exactly. Statistically, right? Exactly. Uh, there's a Scandinavian country a few years ago where all the school girls who had a 12th birthday had a 13th birthday. So zero, a zero mortality a zero rate. zero mortality rate. At that age. At that age. And 
Indeed, if we didn't age, we would die of acute infections, jackknife semis on the 10 interstate, um, getting into fights with our significant others, and other <coughs> really unfortunate events. But it would take a long time for it to happen, all right? Now, part of what I'm going to talk about today is why so, talking so about So, sorry, that. what you're saying yeah. is statistically then 12-year-olds are not immortal, but you're saying statistically 12-year-olds have, ah. have a lifespan of that, of those numbers? If you imbued a human with the physiology of a human 12-year-old for the rest of their lives, they would not be biologically aging. They would still have a death rate, in a sense due to misadventure. Okay, bad accidental events happening, which can happen to any of us. Is that a real life thing or just a statistical thing? Well, that's what I'm talking about today. Okay. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Great setup. Good stuff. It's kind of it's what I do. Yeah, you see, you know, he, he's, he's, he's great talking to Vulcans, so. <laughs> All right. So, let me just take a step back and talk about the ideas about aging that almost everybody believes. Almost everybody, except me, my colleagues and students, and maybe some of you. But right now, I know for sure, my little research community doesn't believe in what everybody believes, which is aging as a kind of cumulative damage or disharmony that arises physiologically in the same vein as the second law of thermodynamics, which is that entropy increases steadily with time, unavoidably, ineluctably, relentlessly, all that ugly stuff, okay? One of the things I want to do today is to destroy your belief in this idea, okay? I'm here to kill this idea. I have been working to kill this idea for 40 goddamn years. <laughs> like a lot of scientists, my nemesis as a scientist is Aristotle. Lightweight. <laughs> Me or Aristotle? Not you. Okay. No, no, no. Aristotle, in fact, was a brilliant man, a truly, truly brilliant man. And he was better at embodying, presenting, and articulating those things that are obviously true than almost any other human being who's ever lived. For example, the Earth is the center of the universe, right? We sit here on a recumbent, inert Earth, and all the heavenly bodies move up there in the heavens around us. What could be more obvious? Okay. Now, in the 16th century, some obnoxious astronomers and mathematicians started saying, well, what if actually it's not the Earth that's the center of what we see around us, it's the Sun, and the Earth and all the planets move around the Sun. And that, of course, is intuitively ridiculous, right? Do you feel like you're moving at hundreds of miles an hour right now? No. I mean, you'd be breaking the speed limit laws in the state of Arizona, <laughs> right? It doesn't make any sense, okay? And not only, according to these heliocentric astronomers, not only is the Earth spinning, it's also rotating at an incredible speed around this gigantic star, truly enormous in size, right? Ridiculous. Doesn't make any sense. So, at the birth of modern science, uh, astrophysics, was a rebellion against that which was obviously intuitively true. You know, that the world revolves around the Earth and the Earth doesn't move, okay? I want to do the same thing for all the ideas you read about concerning aging in books and on the internet and all the media and everywhere. And I have literally been laughed at by journalists, uh, stigmatized by you know, conventional gerontologists and so on for saying no. Now, this kind of rust idea has taken different forms in different centuries 
Aristotle's version of the rust idea more than 2,300 years ago was based on the four Greek elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and the idea that they are in harmony when you're young, which is why you're hot and moist, okay? But later on in life, you become cold and dry, you know, like me. <laughs> so that's Aristotle's idea of how aging works, okay? Made perfect sense to the classical Greeks. In the first half of the 20th century, there were ideas like um, the idea that once you stop growing, you inevitably start dying. This is a theory put forward by a man called Bitter. Um, Aldous Huxley incorporated parts of that idea in his novel After Many a Summer Dies the Swan, a fantastic novel written about anti-aging in 1939. Okay. In the 1950s, rust theories were reinvented in a molecular vein. One of the still prevalent versions is Denham Harmon's free radical theory of aging, which is basically that free radicals, a particular kind of reactive chemical, interact with the macromolecules of your body and progressively degrade them over time. And there's nothing you can do about it. Other variations on the molecular version of rust are the air catastrophe theory, which was put forward in 1969. Nobody believes that one anymore, so they don't talk about it. The somatic mutation theory put forward um, in the late 1950s. Uh, some people still believe in that idea. These are all different versions of rust theories, okay? Which in a way, telomere shortening is, a, is also an example. Of. Telomere shortening is another example that you age Meaning because... It's sort of a breakdown over time because of... Because your telomeres are getting shorter of time, and shorter. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, I think in a, in a brilliant move, Aubrey de Grey uh, sort of solved all of the problems of aging by taking seven different rust theories and putting them together in SENS. Okay? SENS is a syncretic big church version of rust theory, okay? Here's, here's a payoff slide. Rust theories are all wrong. Every single rust theory is wrong. Doesn't matter the variation, doesn't matter whether it's the university professors going from moist and hot when they're younger to cold and dry the way we are now in our 60s, as I am. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's uh, the cessation of growth, doesn't matter whether it's free radicals, doesn't matter whether it's air catastrophes, doesn't matter whether it's somatic mutations, doesn't matter whether it's telomere shortening, they're all variations on rust theories. If these rust theories were correct, every organism that has a genome, that has mitochondria, that has telomeres, they all should age. They all should show a pattern of steadily and radically increasing death rates with age. But evolutionary biologists have long known that there are many species that do not age whatsoever. Here's one example. This particular creosote bush shown here has been alive for more than 10,000 years. All of these surface bushes are interconnected by a common root system. It's been uh, dated by radioactive isotopes, okay? Kind of defeats the theory that you need to have a lot of joy to live a long time. <laughs> well, who knows how much joy creosote bushes really Doesn't experience. seem like a lot. But, <laughs> but, you know, I thought this would be inspiring because, you know, they live in a Phoenix-like environment, the De yeah. Mojave Desert, okay? So they occasionally see rain, you know, like we have recently, but mostly don't. Mostly they live a, a, a dry existence, like, university professors, and sometimes they're cold and sometimes they're hot. Okay, all right. Um, I've been a university professor for too long. Um, now, it's not only creosote bushes, it's not only plants, because some conventional rust gerontologists like to say, oh, but that's because they indef have indefinite division. Uh, there are sea anemones, there are hydra, uh, juniper, a commonly used decorative shrub, Trembling aspen. You can go to stands of trembling aspen standing there looking pristine where those trees have been alive for thousands of years. Okay? Physical immortality, biological immortality is everywhere 
in the natural world. But conventional rust gerontologists just don't want you to believe in their existence. Because every single one of their, those species destroys their rust ideology. Okay? Every single one. Every single one embodies the aspiration that we all have. Okay? So they are all biologically real. They sit there, they stand there, they live forever. You give them good conditions, they will never die. Okay? And now my job is to show you why you're connected to them in terms of what your future holds. We want that. I hope so. I mean, everybody here wants that. Of course there are people of other persuasions, we won't name them, who, who, who welcome death. <laughs> the connection that I'm trying to show you is based on answers to why questions. Like, why the hell? How does this happen? How is it possible for these organisms, plants and animals alike, to laugh at gerontologists? For them to say, you're full of crap. Okay? Why is this possible? Now I'm going to introduce to you the most important thing about life, which is evolution by natural selection. Okay? I know that's controversial in the United States. It's not in other advanced industrial countries. You mean for, are you talking about relig for religious reasons? Is that what you mean? For whatever reasons. Oh, okay. uh, in Stalin's atheistical Soviet Union, conventional evolution by natural selection became controversial because Lysenko advocated Lamarckian evolution. Right. Okay. So there are lots of reasons, ideological, religious, and other reasons, why people have rejected and hated the idea of evolution by natural selection. But I want you to all understand today and tomorrow that it's your main hope. Okay. Because whenever evolution by natural selection pays attention to the problem of cumulative physiological damage or rust, it solves that problem. First, I'm going to give you the simple case, which is the non-aging, biologically immortal animals and plants I just talked about. All of those organisms have in common what's called fragmentary or vegetative or fissile reproduction. That's reproduction where basically uh, a, a large-ish organism splits into two somewhat smaller organisms. No seed or egg, sperm or pollen are involved. So here's a cartoon of this in a single-celled organism. It's reproducing by fission not the nuclear weapon kind of fission. All right? Now think about what that must mean. If there were a physiological process of aging, which was absolutely unavoidable, in all the cell lineages, it would mean all of these species would have died out. They would no longer exist. But actually, Evolution by natural selection can say, we can retune the physiology of any organism any way we like, we being evolution by natural selection. And it can say, well, I'll retune everything about the physiology of this organism so that it can be biologically immortal. And so it has. And so it has happened. Evolution by natural selection saith, give them biological immortality and they have biological immortality, okay? They never age. There's no chronic long-term deterioration unless they're subjected to artificial conditions are you saying, like disease. Are you saying all organisms that reproduce this way yes. are 
are biologically immortal? Yes, that is an absolute unequivocal prediction of the evolutionary theory of aging. And that is exactly what we find in nature. The only cases where it seems like you have symmetrical, symmetry is an important concept here, fissile reproduction, but you have aging, is when it turns out there's a hidden asymmetry. And one of the two kinds of cells or parts of the organism is used as the dumping ground for waste products, toxins, whatever, okay? Now that can happen if you give bacteria, for example, uh, bad toxic conditions in a laboratory, then what they will sometimes do is accumulate all the toxins in one of the two products efficient. As a, as, a strategy, as a survival strategy. Exactly, as a survival strategy, because if they didn't do that, the whole lineage would die out, okay? Um, but if they're given good enough conditions, that doesn't happen, and they can go on living forever, okay? And that's how you get 10,000-year-old organisms, okay? Now, I don't have a slide for this, because I rarely talk about it, but because it blows people's minds when I point out a really obvious fact about you, everybody in this room. You all descend from lineages of vertebrate cells that have been alive for hundreds of millions of years. So the whole we really, need, we really need a slide for that. <laughs> Well, we really I mean, <laughs> if you think about what that slide would be showing, it would be like awkward. Because uh, what we're saying is, right, the oocytes that gave rise to your mother's eggs and the spermatocytes that gave rise to your father's sperm. See why we can't show a slide? <laughs> uh, came from cell lineages that have been propagating for hundreds of millions of years with no goddamn rust stopping them from propagating themselves for hundreds of millions of years. Okay? So you're all products of that particular kind of biological immortality where once again, evolution by natural selection said, telomeres, ha. Mitochondria problems, ha. We don't give a damn. We being evolution by natural selection because we can solve that problem. No difficulty whatsoever, okay? And this is what normally happens in life on Earth because any species which less lets rust never sleep, Neil Young, Canadian, <laughs> illusion, <coughs> any or organism, any species which lets that happen to its germline, dies off. And there are actually conditions under which this happens and in which species do die off. But that didn't happen to our ancestors, and I know that with 100% certainty, being an evolutionary biologist, because we're all still alive, and we know that the, the founders of our phylum, which is chordata, were around 600 million years ago. Okay? So it's been hundreds of millions of years. So there is no biochemical, cell biological, molecular biological necessity effing whatsoever. That's a myth. It's a myth that modern day gerontology is founded on. All right. So that then leaves us with the question, why do we age at all? I mean, if evolution by natural selection can give biological immortality and has done so for all of our ancestral selves. Well, we don't re for one thing, we don't reproduce this way. Uh, correct. Right, that I'm okay. aware of. Well, I mean, what you do in your private life, Joe, that, that's, that's up to you. Uh, but, that's good. But, I'm making the point, okay? There's no molecular cell biological rust. There's no molecular cell biological necessity to aging. 
whether or not aging happens is entirely up to whether or not natural selection is paying attention to keeping you alive or not. All right? That's the whole point. Because not only could it do so, it has done so in the diversity of living forms, plant and animal alike. So what's going on with us? So I'm going to give you just a tiny bit of history that I think is evocative and will make the point. Uh, trigger alert, I'm going to show you some frightening pictures. OK? Um, and you should be scared. So the evolutionary biologist who first, I think, got on the right track was J.B.S. Haldane, my, one of my academic grandparents. Um, who in 1941 suggested that the disease, Huntington's disease, was so common, despite being fatal, because it only started to affect people later in life. Now, some of you are old enough, like me, to have been taught Woody Guthrie folk songs in elementary school, like This Land is Your Land. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. yes. Remember singing that one in class? Sure. Well, Otto wouldn't remember. He was, you, you were in Germany or Austria. <laughs> yeah, or Sarah. But this land is. <laughs> OK. He had Huntington's disease. He died a horrible death in a hospital bed, progressively losing his mind and control over his body, um, either mitigated or exacerbated by Bob Dylan sitting next to him. <laughs> Uh, vampirically, <laughs> yes, stealing his ideas and large parts of his identity. Uh, and now, you know, ever since having made millions of dollars after having done so. Here is what the brain of a Huntington's disease victim looks like. It is rotting away. It's one of actually several diseases that will do this to your brain. Alzheimer's disease will do this too. The difference between Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease is Huntington's disease uh, can start, well, it can start actually in teenagers in very rare cases, but normally it starts to hit adults only over 30. It takes years to kill you. Uh, one of the first clinical symptoms is a problem walking, but also IQ falls, personality changes, the patients become very difficult to deal with, they're institutionalized, eventually they have to be strapped down into hospital beds, and they usually die of suffocation or heart failure because their brain cannot take care of the basic functions of keeping the body alive because the brain is shriveling up and dying. And it's extremely relevant to understanding molecular genetics of aging because this disorder is caused by just having one copy of the Huntington gene allele for this disease. Almost everybody who gets this disease inherited from a parent who themselves was going to die of the disease were they not to die of something else first. So for all of you, this should be a very bad nightmare, right? Okay. Yet this is one of the most common genetic diseases, so common a lot of research has been done on it and a lot of work is in progress toward coming up with a molecular genetic solution to it. Okay? Now I'm going to go to even scarier stuff. Okay? This is progeria, Hutchison Guilford's progeria. This is a child around the age of 10 or 12. Children with this genetic disorder start to look very different from other children between the ages of 3 and 5. By the time they're six or seven years old, they look like tiny little old people. They have lost their hair. They start to lose their childhood teeth. They don't get uh, proper replacement of their teeth. They go toothless. They wrinkle. <coughs> and they develop very severe cardiovascular disease, especially heart disease. To my knowledge, none of them have lived past 20. None of them have lived long enough to ever reproduce. Okay? This disease is so dramatic, it can be diagnosed, you know, standing here at the back of the room. It is completely horrifying. At any one time, there are only 
one to three dozen, roughly, children alive in the world with this disease. Because every single time it occurs, it is because of a brand new mutation in the germline of the parent. Okay? And of course, it's a death sentence. But I want you to notice something really important. Unlike Huntington's disease, this is a spectacularly rare disorder. And what we're now going to talk about is why the difference between progeria and Huntington's disease. This is the difference. This is also the key to understanding your aging. All right? This is the force of natural selection plotted against your biological age. This result, which I cartoon here, is a mathematical result that's derivable from first principles about ev how evolution by natural selection works in populations like ours, which do not divide by fission. In populations that divide by fission, there is no curve like this. But in populations like ours, there always is. And it always produces some type of aging. And this is the most deadly and consequential slide in all of biology. Can you explain again? <laughs> and I'm now going to spend five minutes explaining the slide. <laughs> all right. Let's start with the examples of Huntington's disease and progeria, a childhood aging looking disease. It's not like normal aging at all, but it just looks like it from the outside. Little b is the first age of reproduction in an entire population throughout its evolutionary history. So in humans, little b is around 10 to 12 years old. Okay. <coughs> little d is what I, for this audience, can call the Hugh Hefner parameter. Little d is the last age in which any individual in a population reproduces biologically. We're not talking about recreational activities that lawyers call sex. We're talking about what biologists call sex, which is a meaningful act that leads to our offspring. So we're going to first talk about before little b, commonly called childhood, OK? Before little b, if you have a 100% lethal gene that kills everybody who has that gene before the first age of reproduction in a population, that gene gets immediately screened out of the entire population, right? That's the progeria case. Meaning, All such. Meaning the, 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 the person who's carrying that is, is, is not going to reproduce. And that means that gene never makes it, it into get, the next generation. Right. So a person with that progeria is going to uh, die yes. before they reproduce. So then you're saying that's an example of natural selection, uh, uh, I, guess, I guess selecting against. Aging. Selecting against that cause of which that, means that cause of mortality, which means selecting against an endogenous process of deterioration, right. with one hundred percent effectiveness, because it hits in childhood, because it hits before that gene can make it to the next generation through reproduction. So a child who do, the the vast majority of children have no such genetic disease. The vast majority of children are biologically, frankly, amazing. There's an initial period of great vulnerability when they're making the transition from the uterine environment to walking around in the outside world, okay? When they have high death rates due to that transition and due to the fact that some of them will be killed off by diseases like progeria, like Tay-Sachs disease, will kill off everybody who has, has that genetic disease, okay? But this is why 10-year-olds are spectacular organisms, physiologically. Their skin is tremendous, their ability to 
survive infection is tremendous. Their biological resilience is tremendous. If they damage the cartilage, the cartilage will regenerate. Uh, their bones heal really effectively. They have spectacularly low risk of cancer. We can go on and on and on. So that's why that 12-year-old, that 12 age is, and that's is that why high 12 year olds highest survival rate age, right? Could live 2,000 years if they... As 12-year-olds. If they don't drive on the interstates, if they don't abuse recreational drugs, if they don't get into fights with their significant others, and so on. Okay? That's because everybody under 12 is the benefit, beneficiary of the 100% force of natural selection in exactly the same way that fissile organisms are, and exactly in the same way the germline that produced you was around for hundreds of millions of years. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, Hugh Hefner's last years. Okay. Let's talk about all the ages after the last person biologically reproduces in a population throughout its evolutionary history. What is the fate of a gene that only kills after little d, after the last age of reproduction. Do you think evolution by natural selection gives a damn, Scarlett? No. It doesn't care anymore about your survival if you're out here past little d. Because you're done reproducing. Because evolution by natural selection is, in effect, our description of the consequences of reproduction with genetic variation. Okay? So out here, frankly, Scarlett, natural selection doesn't give a damn. And you're in very bad shape. There's a little note I would like to make about this, however, is that it doesn't care whether you die here or you die out there. And that's going to be important later on today and tomorrow. And mathematically, in between 11 or 12 and Hugh Hefner's last child being born, this curve steadily falls. Ineluctably, irretrievably, it falls. And that decline is how evolutionary biologists explain aging. And we say, we don't care, or more precisely we say, Evolution doesn't care whether you die because of a telomeric problem or a heart structural problem or a problem with draining your brain of its waste products where the glymphatic system connects to the lymphatic system near the hippocampus, which is probably the cause of Alzheimer's disease. Doesn't matter. Evolution doesn't care what gerontologists who are funded by the NIH have to say in any given year about what their lab has shown about this or that mechanism of aging, okay? Evolution says, let a thousand pathologies bloom, okay? Because once evolution doesn't care, it truly doesn't care. Everything can go to hell. Not seven things, not 50 things, a thousand things can go to hell. Okay. So just as there are thousands of physiological things that are amazing about 10-year-old children, there are a thousand physiological things that are our trouble about being in your 70s. Not one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Many, many, many. Evolutionary biologists have been saying this for decades now. Okay. I'm going to talk about some of the data which gives the details on this, but we publish it every six months or so. You can follow our lab on Google Scholar. Just go Michael R. Rose. You'll get your latest update on how complicated aging is. Despite everything I've said to this point, so I've hit you with all the worst news up front, okay? From here on, everything is going to get better. Okay? We're ready. You're ready. Maybe more than ready. Okay, so 
let me, let me give you a cartoon summary of what I just said. Everything revolves around before and after reproduction. Before reproduction, if you've got a lethal gene that's going to kill you before reproduction, evolution by natural selection eliminates it. After the end of reproduction, that's the Red Butler getting totally sick of Scarlett O'Hara point in time. Finally, that poor man said, the hell with you. Okay, you didn't give a damn anymore. Okay, we'll, we'll do this again. Okay. Everything revolves around the timing of reproduction. That's what controls the evolution of aging because that's what controls how natural selection works. Okay. Well, in 1977, a few years ago, I had the following insight. If I were to change the time of reproduction, I could clean out the early part of the life cycle and produce a longer and more robust lifespan just by that one change alone. And natural selection, if we're right about natural selection being the all-important variable in aging, if we're right about aging being a special topic within evolutionary biology and not a special topic within molecular biology, then all I have to do is to change the focus of natural selection and I should be able to easily produce evolutionarily in the lab animals that have a longer and more robust lifespan compared to organisms that had early reproduction. So I did this with fruit flies. First in 1977, this is how we normally reproduce fruit flies. Fruit flies are a fly. They're cuter than house flies. They have red eyes and yellow bodies. Um, and they're not a pest. They won't eat your ripe fruit. They only eat rotten fruit, okay? So don't kill them. In labs around the world, we take young adults that have had sex. We let them, the females, lay eggs. Then we discard all the adults and we start the generation. They go through a larval phase. There's a pupation phase. And out from the pupa pops this pretty adult that within a day, at most a day and a half, will mate and be ready to lay eggs and start the next generation. And normally we do this on a weekly cycle so that our graduate students and technicians can have weekends. Well, I said in 1977, well, hell, I am a graduate student and I don't get weekends. You know, I work 24 seven, up to 24 hours a day. No problem for me. I'll just keep the adults around longer and longer and longer and longer and only when they're older will I let them lay eggs and start the next generation. And I will do this generation after generation. Okay? Because if aging is something neither more nor less than natural selection failing to pay attention to health, however it is shaped physiologically, then doing this for dozens of generations should produce much longer lifespans. This is called a strong inference test, falsifiable prediction, also known as science. Not what most biologists do, but certainly what evolutionary biologists do. Again, this is the concept. We shift reproduction. We clean out the deleterious mutations that act early relative to the timing of reproduction. And our prediction is we should produce a longer and more robust lifespan. Did we? Did I? Yes. This is the pattern of survival in normal fruit flies, handled under identical conditions. This is the percent surviving, 100%. This is the start of adulthood. This is male data, this is female data. Here's what 80 generations of delayed breeding got us roughly a doubling of lifespan and a delay in the onset of aging. Yes, it is possible for natural selection to easily and straightforwardly retune aging. Now, what you can read about... So you're, so you're saying, you're, you're, saying uh, you're kind of using that as an umbrella uh, to, to whatever all the changes that went on that produced that outcome, you're not even necessarily identifying 
specifically okay. all the all the tweaks that occurred inside inside the flies to live yeah. longer. You're that, just that, using that, that overall that, umbrella, right? That is the best setup question I've had in my entire career. <laughs> because we have spent the last 40 years working out what all the little tweaks are. So I can give you some answers. What's involved? Firstly, genomically, there are hundreds of changes in the genome. Hundreds. Some of these involve regular DNA sequences. Some involve transposable elements. Some involve structural variants. Okay. And they just and they just happen automatically or through the selection process. And, and that no CRISPR required. No one's doing that. No one's doing it. Natural selection is doing it. Other dude. than just holding off the reproduction. I mean, in my world, natural selection is God. Yes, I right. Natural selection can do whatever the hell it wants with a life form. Okay. And for natural selection, no problem with complexity. Retuning the genome at hundreds of sites. Well, you could say, yeah, maybe it's hundreds of sites that act on like five or ten important transcripts. No, we know the answer to that one too now. We know that there are more than 600 changes to the transcriptome arising from the few hundred changes in the genome. And those transcriptomic changes are distributed throughout the entire genome. So this is sort of a, a foundation for a holistic argument, right? For a holistic argument uh, around addressing aging. What, 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 whatever, whatever holism means, and it, there are as many holisms as there are holists, uh, <laughs> it is an anti-reductionist okay. result. It is a result that says, no Virginia, it's not one or two or seven damn pathways. It's hundreds of genomic sites affecting more than 600 transcripts, and we're now even working on the metabolites that are affected, and conservatively, that's way more than 600. The level of metabolites, it's probably thousands. But we will actually have the answer to the metabolomic question over the next 10 years. We already know the genomic results. We already know the transcriptomic results. If any of those words are obscure for you, they're really basic to where biology now is in the 21st century. Um, and, you know, I'm not really talking about that. Uh, I will add, I will add to all of that mind-blowing complexity at the cell and molecular levels, we also work on the organismal physiology of these much longer-lived organisms, and many things about them would surprise you. All of their organ functions are transformed, not one or two. Their hearts are more robust. Their brains function better for longer. Their GI tracts function better for longer. They have more ability to detoxify. So they have more ability to survive extreme stress. So it's not like a s localized change. It's an everything change. Exactly. Thank you. That's really good. It's an everything change. Almost everything changes. To extend life like that. To extend life like that. Yeah. So, no, we're not talking about a transformation you can achieve by taking more vitamin E. No. We're not talking about one or two or three genes that you might have inserted in your body. We would be talking about how to insert maybe 200 genes into your body and exquisitely tuning exactly how they work, but that's nowhere near where cell molecular biology is right now. Might get there in 60 years, but it, that's not now. What we can do now is what we're talking about tomorrow. So this, these flies embody what you want. Um, and there's no limit to natural selection's ability to extend lifespan farther and farther and farther. A company called Genesient has taken these flies and pushed them still farther and farther and farther. And they're now living five and six times longer. So just to cheer us up, <laughs> hey, I'll, draw an, I'll draw an analogy. I'm here all week to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Fun so far. Fun so far. This, the, this is analogous to them, some things that we talk about here as far as this uh, uh, not a silver bullet approach to longevity, but, but looking at our life as a totality and, and uh, uh, 
embracing uh, 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 everything yeah. that we can that, that impacts on our longevity. Which is almost everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So retuning your whole life. Right, which is Complete. sort of what Hannah started with. Like, it's like, it's, it's, right, it's retuning your whole life, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no, not, not taking more vitamin E only. We can, we can talk, we can talk about vitamins. Or like tomorrow. resveratrol or, you know, right. Hey, don't talk dirty around me. <laughs> okay, to this point, what I've been talking about is not that weird. We're now going to get deep into the weird with immortality and actually human immortality. Okay? So back to our poster babe, Jen Kemma, dying at 122. If you look at the pattern of aging by humans in the 20th century, like since 19, 1920 to now, the last 100 years, we have a pattern of accelerating death starting after the age of 12, as evolutionary theory would predict, and getting spectacularly worse and worse and worse and worse, up to about the age of 105. If that demographic pattern of dying continued, if our mortality rates continue to accelerate at that same rate, they do unequivocally between you know, 20 and 90, there's no chance any human could live to 110, much less to 115, 117, and 122, which some people are known to have done. So the existence of this woman, that she ever existed in our time, is a whole, is a gigantic anomaly for the idea of indefinite aging. So what we have to do is we have to look carefully at our mortality rates, and when we do, we discover that our mortality rates do not continue to increase indefinitely. This is data first published in 1939, when no one was paying attention to aging, because they had other ways to die, <coughs> regrettably. This is the death rate of English women who lived primarily in the 19th century and died before uh, the early 1930s, between the ages of 93 and 103. And what I want you to notice is this line is, fluctuates a bit, but it's basically flat. It's not doing what death rates normally do, even then what they normally did between the ages of 20 and 80, which is accelerate exponentially. Okay? Aging stops later in life. What the hell? In 1939, nobody paid any attention to these data. Here's what happened in 1992. People published the data on the left, which many labs, like my own, corroborated. And this has been like the most stunning thing in aging research over the last 30 years. These are mortality rates on a log scale. And these lines here at the beginning of adult age, this adult age, are zooming up. You'd see it more clearly here. This is data from my lab. And then they stop increasing, and the mortality rates go flat. So you're not any more likely to die once you, once you go up that curve and hit this plateau. And you hit that plateau, you're not any more likely to die, or going back to the previous one, you're not any more likely to die at age 95 than you are at age 90. Well, 95, then at 100, then at 105, then at 110. So you have to understand, aging is not the fact that you die, because we can all die. Aging is this relentless exponential increase in your risk of dying and everything going to hell physiologically along with it, okay? okay? Yeah. Yet it stops. So, uh, yeah. so the likelihood of dying doesn't, isn't increasing. Right, so by a demographic definition, and in fact the definition scientists use, aging stops. First discovered in humans, but nobody had ever shown it in a lab animal until about 30 years ago when they produced these data. And since they, they published these data in 1992, journal called Science. Since then, many labs, 
including my own, have reproduced this phenomenon over and over again. The reason why we didn't notice it is you have to have enough organisms alive after the aging phase to be able to detect the fact that aging has stopped. So aging we don't, stops. So we don't really have a better, we don't really have a better chance of, of, of survival. It just doesn't get worse. Exactly. So it doesn't just, it doesn't continue to get worse. In other words, you'd think it would just drop off a cliff, right? You'd think... Conventional rust that, gerontology says that aging being a cumulative process of damage and disharmony, when you're really old, you're just going to zoom toward the grave and nothing will stop it. And you're saying that doesn't really happen. And we're saying, no, dude, it stops. <laughs> no, dude, it effing stops. Okay? Yeah, why? Why? Fantastic question. When these data were published, no one had a good explanation. Uh, I can talk in the question period about their first lame attempts to explain it, but that's okay. Within four years, uh, Larry Muller and I published a better explanation. Now, if you think what this result is showing you, it's showing you the following thing. Our life cycle is divided into three phases. Childhood, development, when we are physiologically awesome, because natural selection really, really effing cares. Natural selection is working full tilt to keep children alive and healthy so they can reach the point of being able to reproduce. Okay, job one for natural selection, acting on our life cycles. Then we start to reproduce and right away aging hits. Right away things start to go wrong. Okay. Right away, teenagers develop weird but very small health problems. Bad complexions, difficulty sleeping, stuff like that. And then all those problems just mount and get worse and worse and worse for a very long time until, weirdly, they stop. And you hit a biologically immortal phase in which your mortality rates do not continue to increase. Okay. Now, if you're thinking, Wow, this is weird. This makes my head hurt. If you're thinking that, you are paying attention. Okay? This should make your head hurt. Okay? If your head hurts right now, if you're going, why did I get up this morning to drive to People Unlimited to have my head hurt like this? Why did I do this to myself? Okay, you are wide awake. You're not having a bad dream. Or actually, if you think about it carefully, a good dream. Okay, because actually this is spectacular news. It's more spectacular than almost anybody has yet conceived. But first I have to tell you why. Okay. So this is the force of natural selection. When it's high, it's strong, childhood. When it's down here, the force is gone. The force isn't always with you. Okay. All right, may the fourth be with you. <laughs> what if you invert that diagram and plot it as the weakness of natural selection? Very low weakness of natural selection, start of reproduction. That weakness steadily increases all through the reproductive phase. But then it doesn't get any worse. And then it stops getting any worse. The weakness comes to an end. And frankly, Scarlett, Natural selection doesn't care anymore about you rushing off to the grave. Yeah. It's fine. It's equally fine with you dying at 95 or 2005. There's an immortal phase at the end. That's what evolutionary theory predicts out of that force of natural selection result, which comes from mathematical first principles. So, here's the quirk. You know, when you're doing actual science, not cell biology, when you're doing actual science and you make a really bizarre theory that comes from equations, and there's a parameter in, equa in an equation you can tune then amazing things become possible. In physics, black holes become possible. Okay? In physics, the fact that you can't go faster than the speed of light is what you're stuck with. 
in this math, what we've shown you is that if you're a fissile organism, you're always biologically immortal. In this math, we've shown you if you're the germline for a species, you're biologically immortal. And in this math, we've shown you that after the last stage of reproduction in a population, evolution will give you biological immortality. If that's true, and we take an evolving population and we change the last stage of reproduction, we should be able to change the age at which biological immortality starts. So we tested that prediction. In populations that had different last stages of reproduction, these same populations you've already seen. These B-type populations here that end reproduction very early, these O-type populations that end reproduction very late. Trailer park trash, people with doctorates. Okay? So the prediction is, these guys should hit biological mortality later, these guys early. Which would show you, if true, that the timing of biological immortality is tunable, biologically. And here are the results. The asterisk is when biological immortality starts. In the, er in the early reproduced populations that stop reproducing early, they hit their immortality plateaus early. In the ones that stop reproducing much later, they continue aging for longer. They hit the plateau later, but notice also the height of the plateau is different. This shows you that the timing and the nature of biological immortality are tunable. Biological immortality is out there. It's tuned not by a deity, but by regular biology. Evolution by natural selection. What does all of this mean? Firstly, plenty of organisms have biological immortality. All the rust theories are wrong. You are not condemned to rust every day that you live. We know why some organisms age and some organisms don't. We know why in some parts of your life you're aging and in some parts of your life you're not aging. It's because of what natural selection is doing. It is only about natural selection and what natural selection does. And then in human aging, and in the aging of many other organisms, aging stops very late in life because the weakness of natural selection stops increasing, the force stops declining, which means we age toward biological immortality. Okay? It's taken me all this time to get to those five words. Okay? So, if you don't wipe out on the 10 interstate or have some other disaster happen to you, you face the possibility of transitioning from aging to biological immortality. And the significance of that in your daily lives is what I'll talk about tomorrow. Thank you. You can see why that would be so problematic <laughs> on so many levels, especially in, in a, projected into an academic environment, which is um, thinking in a very, very different way. So um, you want to take a few questions? Yeah. Okay. So I take the risk of oversimplifying things. but. For us, the first 100 years might be challenging, and after that is smooth sailing. That's what I hear. Otto. <laughs> Thank you for that incredibly hard question. <laughs> that, that's what we're talking about tomorrow. Okay? So, the whole question of getting everybody in the room to biological immortality is the project. Okay. And the nature of your life 
when you are biologically immortal is what we have to talk about. But you have to understand, the biological immortality is out there waiting for you. You come from biological immortality. You go through this time of challenge called aging. You go through the valley of sorrow, right? You go through that. And at the other end is biological immortality. Okay? That's what the real science of aging shows you. Not the, frankly, horrifying gerontology we have now, which is saying, rust never sleeps. You're going to rust your way to oblivion without any, without any change. Okay? That's what regular gerontology says. But, that, but that's not to say that there isn't, there is, there is, that's not to say there isn't some rust that we need to take care of, right? You're just saying, you're just saying rust isn't the prime mover in, in aging. Uh, well, the rust concept, so, so what so you're asking me is sort of, if you know your history of chemistry, it's like you're saying, but the phlogiston is still important, right? Even though we have oxygen. And, yes. and if it doesn't mean anything to you. Yeah. Or, or, see, an Einsteinian would say, yeah, you can't just add, you know, like you can't sit on a train, so Einstein used this language, going at a particular speed and shine a, a, a lantern and have that lantern go at the speed of light plus the speed of the train, okay? None of those things make any sense in this new world. Okay? Yeah, I get it. right. So, so children, okay, children, yeah, they can have broken legs. They can have scars in their faces. Uh, they can, in a few cases, get cancer and have the cancer removed. And they'll be scarred, disabled, to whatever extent that damage happened, at whatever level it happens. Uh, the biologically immortal trembling aspen can get tree diseases. They can have bark beetles messing up their, their trunks. All those things can happen. But there's a fundamentally different problematique between all the bad things that can happen to you when you're biologically immortal and what's happening in aging. Aging is not about a bunch of accidents that are imposed on you from an external environment, from quirks of free radicals or anything like that. Wear and tear. Wear and tear at any level. I mean, you know. People who run over so you're the saying, age of... So you're saying wear and tear is wear and tear, but it's not aging. Wear and tear is a real phenomenon. It affects cars, houses, children. People? Uh, trembling aspen. People at any age. Right. It's got nothing to do with aging. Absolutely nothing to do with aging. Everybody who tells you aging is inevitable because of wear and tear, they're wrong. Okay? It's garbage. It's fundamentally misconceived. Completely wrong. You come from biological immortality. You live long enough, you will go back to biological immortality. Okay? <laughs> I think we like that. We like that. <laughs> Sarah. Wow, fascinating. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, since my early life. Hold that I, mic up, sorry. Hello? There you hello? are. Hello? There you are. I was watching women. It was really interesting for me to know where I am going. Where I am going as a beautiful young woman, child, whatever. Where I'm going, it really was curiosity. And I saw women, especially the religious women that having baby after baby after baby until 60. And look, they were so healthy and functioning and strong. And then they die. But they live long. On the opposite side, I see bachelors that didn't have any baby at all and they withered so fast and they died. Um, when I see the the amazing thing that you represent about that plateau. 
I am wondering, because my wish was I want to be 12 years old all my life. Sure. All yeah. my life. Yeah. I said, it's, oh, it's a ha ha feeling. It's a wonderful uh, uh, production in the body, not mm -hmm. out of the body. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, how can I do the plateau as a, not to struggle and to uh, 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 deteriorate mm -hmm. earlier? Right, so tomorrow I'm going to talk about the possibility of getting you onto the plateau in the next two or three years. Yeah, because uh, this lady that you showed, Clement. Yeah? Yeah, but, uh, yes. Okay, but I want to enhance the dead lady that you show up. Jeanne Clement. Clement, yes. Uh, at the end she died and she was very, very old and deteriorated and I yeah. don't want to be that. Uh, okay. So, I hope this is not being recorded because I'm about to get into really deep water. <laughs> uh, one of the things that confused a lot of people about what's happening on the plateau is uh, the death spiral. And uh, this is primarily the research of my very close colleague, Larry Muller, although I encourage him. Um, when an organism starts to die, at any age of systemic causes, like the progeria victims, the hunting Korea victims, uh, people who develop cancer, people who develop diabetes, okay, and go from diabetes type 2 to early stage heart disease to progressive heart disease and then die, they're in the death spiral. The death spiral hits at any age. <clears throat> A large part of why people think being biologically immortal is not a good idea is they're getting confused about people who are on the plateau and are in the death spiral with those who are not in the death spiral. Okay? And, the, the, and, and like, this may sound like a bunch of words to you, but words are all I really have to communicate with you. Sure. What really confuses people about what life is like on the plateau of biological immortality, is they see some people becoming very decrepit, like Madame Jeanne Camon in her last three years of life. She started to become demented and incoherent and bedridden and so on. <clears throat> They're overlooking the fact that she rode a bicycle when she was 100, okay? And she was a lively, fun person between the ages of 100 and 110, 115, which were years she spent on the plateau, okay? The death spiral makes anybody's life miserable, whether they're getting on the death spiral at nine, the way they are in progeria, at 40 or 42, the way they are with Huntington's Korea, the way they are with diabetes in their 50s, or indeed on the plateau. Okay, the death spiral always sucks. The death spiral is a general phenomenon. Um, dying due to internal dysfunction takes a while, and it's not pretty. But it's not the same thing as, as aging at all. Mm -hmm. Aging is a different thing altogether. And we have published papers where we've partitioned aging and immortality from the death spiral. The death spiral is, is in a sense, a fourth phase of life. Okay? Um, and I can talk about that separately from my presentations. I don't have any slides prepared for it, but we've published on it. It's a, a, a very significant part of the book, Does Aging Stop? Concerns the death spiral. Because you have to partition the death spiral out from your data to detect what's really going on with aging and biological immortality. So thank you for the incredibly difficult question which I cannot adequately answer today. <laughs> Sorry. Um, maybe next year I can come back and talk about the death spiral. Um, it's not as much fun as talking about biological immortality. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yes, I, w I will talk about it. I, I won't go into the scientific analysis of death spirals tomorrow. Another, another takeaway from sort of the, early, the middle section of w when you're talking about the, the change of the, uh, the longevity of the flies is uh, a takeaway that uh, I'm asking that um, Things we do that have a broad spectrum effect, it seems like you're making the case that those things are much more relevant than sort of targeted 
specific uh, <laughs> uh, uh, cure, cure, yeah, and, cures. Yeah, and, and, and let's spend a lot of time talking about that tomorrow, because that is, that is exactly a live issue. Because you, it sounds like you're saying there's so much complexity in what actually drives aging. Right, there is. That things like, fr frankly, fucking positive thinking, you know. I'm not a critic of positive thinking. Right, but because that's a, sort of a broad spectrum, potentially has a broad spectrum impact over, you know, a lot of these very, very And it specific. probably changes the level of multiple hormones and thousands of metabolites in your body. Right, so, so, so it sounds like there's a case to be made based on, based on your data yes. for, for, and I guess, I guess you could say exercise does that too because it's just I think the word, so many things. The word you're getting toward, Joe, is lifestyle. Yeah. yeah, transforming your lifestyle and that will be a big part of what I'm talking about tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> in a sense, um, when they say the, um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> Hormesis, it's not in science. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, also mentally or physically, if yeah. I was... So, we all face all kinds of difficulties in life, right? Exactly. Mental or physical. Yes, or both. Now, yeah. yeah, so in one time, it's either, either you're just breaking and yep. towards dying mm -hmm. or you get stronger right right um and we see it over here right i mean like i you know our community is amazing because right. we stay a long time together and we see all kinds of things you know yep. so um my grandma uh, she had she i don't know she died 90 or i don't know over there and she had towards the end of her life she had a cancer bone cancer mm -hmm. and they told us I, I don't understand anything in medicine and stuff but what they told us that that she can live long with that because all of her metabolism all the mm -hmm. system is slow yes and cancer is not a death sentence when you're over 90 the way it is when you're 30 Right, is it because all, everything is just slowed down? We, we, don't, we don't... Wow, you, you guys are great at asking incredibly hard questions. Uh, <clears throat> so, so cancer is a disease of uncontrolled cell proliferation. Um, when you're younger, your cells are inherently better at proliferating. Um, the older you get, for a whole host of reasons, your body is not as good at sustaining cell proliferation so to put it in the most simple and reductive terms possible, the cancer is not in as comfortable a home when you're older. And in fact, a lifestyle trick with cancer is to make your body as hostile to cell proliferation as possible, which is basically what they do with radiation therapy and chemotherapy. But you can also do with intermittent fasting, uh, ketosis, um, chronic uh, exercise, and so on. Uh, I mean, I don't want to freak anybody out, but everybody in this room over 50 has some type of malignancy in their body somewhere. Might only be a few cells, but they're there, okay? The question is what's going to happen with those cells. Um, we have uh, tumor killer cells, which will when we're younger and, and when we're in good condition, at any age, good condition, uh, will come and find those cells and kill them. And heads up, they use free radicals to do it. So if you take an anti-free radical supplement, you are impeding your body's ability to fight cancer. Okay? Think about that. Vitamin E is an example of such a substance. But, okay, the older you are, all right, the less supportive your body is toward cancer, inherently. The fewer excess calories you consume, the more hostile your body is toward cancer. Though there's a knife edge there because you also need extra calories to fight the cancer and to deal with the nausea and the reduced nutrition associated with the cancer. So, you know, I'm not an oncologist. I don't treat people with cancer. 
you basically introduce this theme, which is hormesis, that which doesn't kill makes you stronger, okay? Where that is the stress, okay? So cancer is not happy with stress. And that's at the core of chemotherapy and radiation therapy for cancer. That's like an incredibly hostile thing to do to the proliferating cells, okay? So uh, I'm actually gonna talk about this kind of issue more tomorrow, okay? So I'm all getting all these great setup questions for tomorrow. <laughs> I'm here all week, I'm here all week. Uh, just make sure you pay your minimum and t tip the waitress before you leave. Thank you. Okay, we got uh, one more question sure. here. Hi. Hi. Okay, I have a question, maybe it's obvious, but I, I, I want to ask. Sure. So let's see, for me, I, I think that the hormonal process in females yes. is respond to the natural selection. When you get a certain mm -hmm. age, the estrogen, the testosterone, la 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 la, disappear. You, la, cannot, la, la. <laughs> you cannot reproduce babies, right? right? So what about, I do all my treatment, thelemeter, steam cells, right. and by 100, 120, my body can start reproducing again. So mm -hmm. the natural selection is gonna show up again or because my lifestyle and my belief is not gonna be there. So okay. what is gonna happen if I am 150 and my body's ready to have a baby? Right, okay, so, um, unlike a lot of people who work in this area, uh, we have always considered reproduction and the prolongation of reproduction right from the start of our research, okay? So uh, our vision of uh, biological immortality and anti-aging includes the capacity to reproduce at much later ages. And it always has. And uh, so people like me, the, the tiny community of evolutionary biologists who study aging, uh, are all about extending the reproductive period. Okay. okay? So we're totally open to that. Okay. We don't say, oh, no, 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 all we care about is keeping you alive and, you know, you're not suing us for malpractice. Okay. So we're not like that. Okay. But my case, I, I, I'm not looking to have a baby, but I don't want to go through the, I don't want to go through the process that I'm 100, 150, and my hormonal process start declining again because respond right. to the natural selection. I don't want that. Okay, I want so, my so, hormone be okay, forever. So, so let's be clear, <laughs> everybody today, okay? Uh, natural selection doesn't operate within your body, within your life, except in the special case of tumor cells. Okay. Okay, and your adaptive immune system. Leaving those two things aside, you don't need to worry about natural selection coming after you and messing with you. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, great, thank you very much. <laughs>